Pray really quick. Our precious Lord, we uh, thank you for this time that we get to study your word, and we ask uh, would you please help us to discern accurately and rightly uh, the truths within, and that in so doing you might bring us closer to the mind of Christ. In his name, amen. All right, uh, please turn with me to our text for this morning in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. And we're going to be covering verse 5 to 10, picking up where we left off last time. And so we'll turn there, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Okay, uh, it reads, verse 5, This is the message we have heard from him, and announce to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Uh, and so just a little bit of review from last time uh, when we were in 1 John. Uh, we were looking at, uh, 1 John, it was written by the last remaining apostle alive, most likely, and that was the apostle John himself. And the audience that 1 John is writing to, the scripture doesn't say explicitly, but most likely is to the churches in Asia Minor. Uh, and that's because based on several writings that we have from the early church leaders, uh, some of which include Papias, Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, uh, just to name a few, they all indicate basically that John has been in Ephesus um, ever since, or following the time of Christ's resurrection up until his death. And so that's uh, this area of Ephesus and Asia Minor surrounding it is the location, the locale that Apostle John is focusing his apostolic ministry in. Uh, and so now uh, Ephesus it was really this sort of intellectual center, this intellectual hub uh, in Asia Minor in that you had all these philosophical influences and these like higher thinkers that really gravitated towards um, and kind of passed their ideas back and forth here. Uh, and so that's kind of the background that you have. And uh, really uh, the expository Bible commentary summarizes very nicely and it says this. One can expect converts from this community to inevitably bring much philosophical and religious verbiage with them into the church body. And this or these kinds of people would be all too eager to reinterpret their newfound faith in terms of modern thought. And rather than render total allegiance to Christ alone, their interests would lean more towards keeping the best of both traditions, that is, as if to marry together Christianity with higher paganism. Uh, so long story short, you have all these really intellectual people, probably very enthusiastic, who looked like Christians on the outside, but really they're bringing in all this false extra verbiage, all this extra garbage, and they're bringing all this false teaching really into the church and jumbling up the truth for everybody else. Um, and, um, and really, we'll, we'll come to the, back to the specifics of that later, but that's the gist of what we're dealing with here in the setting of 1 John. Uh, it's just a review again. Uh, we also learned last time that we who have been saved through Jesus Christ have fellowship with God and with each other. Uh, koinonia was the word that we saw for fellowship, and literally it means commonness or uh, partnership. We are literally sharers of grace shares of eternal life. And we also saw that our fellowship, this fellowship, this koinonia was non-conditional. That is, once you're saved, you don't ever get unsaved. It's never based on your performance in terms of how good you were or are or will be. It's given as a result of grace through Christ. Uh, furthermore, we found out John's goal in writing this epistle in verses three and four, and that they are basically twofold. One, John wants to confront false believers in order that they might see their error, repent, and then enter into the true fellowship. And then two, John also wants to address those in the true fellowship in order to make sure that they are walking the light and living in the complete joy of fellowship. And that's verse four. And remember, the joy of the fellowship was what is at stake here when it comes to true believers. We can't lose the actual fellowship itself, but we can lose an element of it, and that was the joy of fellowship. Uh, we, it is possible for a true believer, a true convert of God, to not experience the joy of his fellowship with, with God and with each other uh, as part of the local body. 
And so these are two of John's goals here that he uh, lists out for us um, right away and John accomplishes both of these goals basically in the same way and that's with a series of tests. Some are doctrinal, some are practical and he uses these tests to identify basically who's the false believer here and who's the true believer. And uh, that's because there's just so much confusion again of all these false teachers hanging around. And so as we look into our text this morning, we're going to see that John is basically going to list out several indications for both false believers and uh, true believers as well in a side-by-side -side manner uh, as, as if to compare the two. And uh, I, just so you don't get lost or too lost on me, I made a quick outline that I want you guys to keep at the back of your head um, as we go through this together. And so as a whole, I've decided to title this message, The Tests of truth. And that's because as we look at these tests that John lays out for us, we're going to see John repeatedly coming back to this idea that um, this idea that um, that truth is being or that we need to make sure that truth is being clearly found in us. And if that's not the case with us, then we basically prove ourselves to be unbelievers and strangers even to the fellowship of truth. And so truth is what is um, the, uh, what, what's, not what's at stake, but truth is going to be the dividing factor here. Uh, is there, are you someone who's characterized by truth or are you not? And that's going to be what defines if you're a true believer or a false believer. Um, and so first, um, just kind of working our way through the outline now, uh, I'm going to list it out point by point and we'll uh, dive in deeper as we go along. First, we're going to look at the basis of truth and that's verse 5. What is truth to begin with? What is truth based on? What is it in relation to? Uh, what is the absolutes here? Because when we're talking about truth, we're not talking about an opinion or any, any relative um, standpoint. We're talking about um, the truth. And so what is the truth? And who defines the truth? Um, and so we'll talk about that first. And then second, we're going to talk about the characteristics of those in whom there is no truth. And so who, what kind of person is a false believer? Uh, what kind of things do they say that kind of hint and even give evidence that they are indeed false believers and are absent and void of the truth? And so that's going to be verse 6, 8, and 10. And then third, the last point, there's just three points, a very easy outline. Third will be the characteristics of those who are indeed in the truth. And that is going to be verses 7 and 9. That's going to be characteristics of those who really are who they say they are. Uh, they are in the fellowship here. And so you'll notice that the verse references sort of go back and forth in a kind of a alternating flow. And again, that's just because John is purposefully placing these characteristics side by side, uh, describing the false believer and then describing the true believer and then the false believer and then the true believer over and over again uh, as if to highlight the differences between these two groups. And so with that, let's go ahead and tread um, into our new uh, text, uh, new ground here. First point in our outline again was the basis of truth. That's verse 5. This is the message, verse 5, that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so we'll focus on the first part here. So John, he first reaffirms the authority of his message. Um, he is saying that what he's about to say in the coming verses comes directly from Jesus Christ. Why does he say that? Why does he see the importance in saying that? What is he trying to accomplish here? What does he accomplish here? And well, you know, like we said, there were these false teachers who were growing in their influence within the Asia Minor churches. And John, knowing this, he directly wants to, he directly does warn the flock to be on the alert. And you don't have to turn to these, but let me read to you a couple examples of John's warnings in this epistle, just so that you have an idea of just how much of a problem this was. So 1 John 4, verse 1, it says, John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so here, John is establishing the very real problem that, look, false, the false teachers, the false prophets here, there are many of them. There's a whole lot of them. There's not one or two or even a little group. They're all over the place. And so uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, John is needing to, or well, John is wanting to uh, lay out his credentials here. And, um, and then also, too, back up, if you back up a little bit in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, he says another warning here. He says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. And so not only are there a whole lot of them, these false teachers, but they're looking to deceive. They're not passive here. They've, they've got an agenda. And that agenda is to false around that false teaching. Um, and, and not only deceivers here, but you know what? They're one more thing. They're flat out anti-Christ. 
And uh, you back up again in chap uh, chapter 2, verse 18, and you'll see that. And, and John says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. And so false prophets are anti Antichrist in the sense that what they believe and what they teach goes against the very nature, and against the very person of Jesus Christ. And so these guys are the enemies here. And, you know, imagine this, you know, this sizable, zealous, heretical group of false teachers, and they're false teachers, they're not just false members, again, so it's not, they're not a passive bunch here, they're active, they're actively looking to lead the flock astray. This is a formidable force that John is up against here. And you know what? John is more than up to the task. He's more than up to the task. And you know why? That's because he coming, he's coming to the fight with the big guns. He's coming to the fight with the truth, armed to the teeth. And the truth, not just the truth as based on his uh, recollection, but the truth told directly from Christ himself. And you know what? He's also not going to hold anything back. He's, 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 this, look, 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 again, in verse, uh, verse 5. He says, this message we have heard from him, and look, he, he says, I'm not just going to repeat it to you. I'm going to announce it to you. I'm going to announce it to you. So John is locked and loaded here with truth, and, and, and you know he's coming. He's going to come in with guns blazing. He's not going to hold anything back. And you know you say, why are you doing that, John? You know it, it, that that's too much. That's too harsh. That's too heavy. You can uh, you you might offend somebody. But you know I think I really believe that the reason, if I could speak for John, I truly think that he's concerned with only one thing here in this epistle. By the time he's done with these five chapters, I really believe that John wanted the truth to be so obvious. And even so painfully clear that, that these people are true believers and these people are not true believers. And when that is absolutely clear, when error is made clear, because truth is so painfully clear, then the church can purge the, the outsiders on their own and protect the church against false teaching and heresy. And so I think, I really think that that's what John is getting at here. He wants there to be no doubt as to who is part of the true fellowship and who is not. Because this problem is so wide reaching, really there can be, I can't think of any other um, alternative. Um, and so um, John is going with um, this way. Uh, he's presenting the truth full blown. And so that's what we're getting ourselves into, guys. Uh, Apostle John is basically going to, pretty much going to machine gun us with uh, these tests of, um, who is a true believer and who is not. And so here we go. And, uh, and so we'll move on. In, uh, still in verse 5 here. So we know that John's going to announce the truth here. Well, what's the first thing that John's going to announce? Well, we'll read on. Um, again, this is the message we have heard from him. Now, so you, what? That God is light. And we'll stop here. If we are to know what walking in the light looks like, in verse 7 that he mentions later, we're going to first need to know what the light is. And that ties into the first point of our outline again, that God, uh, God, John says, is light. And we need to unpack this a little bit. And what does that statement tell us about God? Well, this isn't the first time that God is referred to as light. You know, it's, um, God is referred to in this way in many, many places in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, and so in the interest of time, we're just going to look at two characteristics of God that um, that light points to. Uh, but even with just those two, I think you'll really see why light is just such a fitting description of God. Uh, and so if you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60, and this is really, um, really, um, really something. And so we'll turn it together in Isaiah chapter 60. And so here in chapter 60, basically the, the background here of what's going on is that Isaiah is basically looking to the future and he gets a good look at what New Jerusalem looks like. And that, that, that's basically New Jerusalem is the capital, the new capital holy city when God creates a new heaven and a new earth following the millennial kingdom in the future. And check out what he says here in verse 19. And it's pretty crazy. He says, he says this, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light, but you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and your God will for your glory. And so you see that in the future, God, when God recreates the world, there's going to be no need for a sun or any moon because God's own presence is so bright and so radiant uh, that he's going to illuminate everything uh, by himself. 
And so you have God as an everlasting light here and God for your glory. And so what does that tell us? Basically, God is, God is full of splendor and glory and there's really nothing else that is more glorious than he is. Not any moon or any sun. And so, uh, and so that's the first point that light points to God's uh, glory um, and his splendor. And so the next characteristic, turn with me to Psalm, chapter 36, verse 9. And we'll read here in verse 9, chapter 36. Okay, it says, For with you is the fountain of life, in your light we see light. And so, it's, it's only when, you see here, it's, it's, it's a parallel comparison here. Light is basically equivalent to life. Our own salvation, the very nature of it, is, is light. In that it's pure, and, there, and it really only in God can there be found eternal life. And so light and life in this, uh, in this reference here is, equiv is equivocal. It's the same. And you know, really, it's only when God turns his light on that we see and, and what I mean by that is, you know, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't understand anything if God didn't reveal it to us. We wouldn't understand his plan for salvation. We wouldn't understand his nature. We wouldn't understand his person. We wouldn't understand truth, definitely. And so in this way, just as light is revealing and it shows, it reveals the path, just in that way, God's own character reveals what holiness and what truth really is. And so you can't, you can't understand, God is light itself in the sense that he's truth itself. <laughs> you cannot bypass that. If you're going to understand what the truth is, you have to basically, you have to draw near to God himself and understand who his character is. And how, what practical, what's the practical way that that unfolds? Well, it's through knowing the word. Because like we learned last time in 1 John, the very person of God is his word manifested. And so it's one and the same. His word, it's him, his person, it's him. And so if we're going to come to understand God in a, in a closer way, in a closer manner, then we need, to, we need to understand his word. And that's where our desire ought to be. And let me, uh, and also uh, turn with me to, to Matthew 15. And I'll show you the, um, a picture of what the opposite of that looks like. Opposite of the opposite of knowing truth and having um, or, or having the light of God reveal what truth is to us. Without God, knowing truth is impossible. And before we knew God, we were literally blind. And that's what it says here in Matthew chapter 15, verse. Uh, we'll start in verse 13. And this is this is in reference to the self-righteous Pharisees. And Jesus answers his disciples here in in, in verse uh, verse 13. He says, "Every plant." which my heavenly Father did not plant, shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind, and if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. You see there, without God, without God's illuminating light, without God illuminating truth in their minds, you know, in us, we're just blind people. And we, we're just blind people really leading and being led by other blind people. And you can be sure that it, that's a hopeless case. That's a hopeless situation. And if you see there, both will fall into a pit. And that's, that's, a, that's almost like a promise. That's, that's a fact, a matter of fact. And I don't think I have to explain to you guys what the pit stands for. I think it speaks for itself. And you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really scared of heights, and so for me in particular, that's the no bueno. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and so trust, it, 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 or not, uh, truth, it must be found in God's person, and God's person is found in his word, which we laid out last time. I won't take the time to go back over it again uh, today because we really got to move on. Uh, next, turn with me to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is a familiar verse for a lot of us. Um, chapter 1, verse 15. And it says, uh, Peter says, here, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
And so you see there the only reason we can actually be holy now is because the one who is holy called us. <laughs> you see that? Like the wo holy one who called you. That, that's a prerequisite. You must be called if you're going to be holy. Because without the holy one, you're not going to know what holy looks like. And alongside that, we are to be holy like, it says there, like the Holy One. Or another way of saying it is just as God is holy. In other words, practically, we are to shape our holiness exactly after no one else's but God's own holiness. And anything else, if we're, if we're going to shape our holiness after another person's holiness, someone we look up to even, even a, an older brother, if, if ultimately, if our ultimate reference point is not the Holy One himself, the Holy of Holies, then it, we're going to fall ultimately short. We need to look upon Christ. I mean, sure, we, sure there's, there is a place for discipleship and for accountability, but our, the ultimate focal point can't stop there. It has to go all the way to Christ who is our Lord. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he is the very definition of light and holiness and truth. And so really, stopping anywhere short, it's, it's not going to get anywhere. Um, and so that's that. Um, and also, too, if, if you turn back, let's turn back to our text in 1 John. Uh, it just straight out says that, I, um, that point as well, that we have to walk in the light as um, as Christ himself is in the light. And that was in verse 7. Um, you, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll just mention that right now. We'll, we'll go deeper into that um, as when we get there. Anyways, um, where am I? Um, oh, yes. So, um, so just as uh, light illuminates and makes the way clear, in the same way God sheds light upon truth, including truth about salvation, truth about righteousness, truth about holiness. And another way of saying that is our outline point is that he is the basis for all truth. And, um, and any, all of our understanding of truth needs to be founded upon him and his person and built upon that. Okay, and so we'll move on um, to the last half of verse 5 in chapter 1 again. And so it says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And so not only is, is God light, but he is, uh, and he is the only light, but, but, in, but uh, he's, he also too is totally pure in that there is no darkness. There is no unrighteousness found ever in him. And that's kind of a no-brainer, but um, there are very, very important applications that uh, we can get for us um, understanding that. And uh, I'll just read to you really quick. Uh, Psalm 145, verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. And so just reiterating that, that undeniable truth. And then actually, uh, turn with me to, to Habakkuk, though, because um, I think this, this would be good to see for us. That's almost um, right before New Testament, before Zephaniah, after Nahum. And that was Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. And he says, it says, it says of the Lord, um, Habakkuk does, he says, Your eyes, speaking of the Lord, are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And so, look. Guys, God is so righteous. He is so righteous. He cannot simply overlook your sin. Sin has to be punished one way or another. It has to be punished. And that's why Jesus Christ had to die for your sin. If you are saved, Jesus Christ had to die for you. Because God, God's righteousness requires that sin be punished. And that's what he did in Christ on your behalf. If you are believing into him as your Lord and your Savior. That's exactly what needed to happen, and that is what happened. That is the reality of your life if you are placing your faith in Christ. On the flip side, if you have not surrendered your life to Christ, there is no promise for forgiveness for you, and you are still under the full weight of God's wrath, and you know there can be only one expectation in such a scenario, and that is judgment. And so, guys, I'm being very serious with you now. If you, if you have not repented and come to 
come back to the Lord and surrender to him and confess faith, begging him to forgive you in Christ, believing what he's done for you, if you haven't done that, then really, really consider your heart because nothing else in this world is, is important at all until you, until you solve this great, the greatest problem in your life, which is this, that God's wrath is upon your sin. <laughs> and it will be exercised either on you or if you, choose, if you choose to believe and put all your faith in Christ, then, then on him, in your place. And so just that, that really warrants some very serious consideration. And I do want to encourage you guys to do that if you have not done so already. Uh, that's just a side point. Um, anyways, uh, let's get back and move on. Uh, so darkness, it's uh, the very opposite of light. And it stands for, unlike light, darkness is basically a Christ-less life. And you don't have to turn here, but we know from Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that we who believe have been literally rescued by God out of the domain of darkness and transferred into his kingdom. And before that, though, we were all once children of darkness. We all started there. And the only reason that we are now in the light is because we were literally plucked out. We were literally plucked out of that dark domain and transferred into life. And uh, turn with me, though, uh, right now to uh, John, the Gospel of John, um, chapter 1. And we'll see, we'll find out another thing about darkness here. And that's chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. And uh, we read here, in him was life, talking of Christ, and the life was the light of men. Again, uh, talking back about that point, that life and light really is synonymous here, in that it is a quality that only the Lord has, and those who believe into him. And uh, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And so, um, I, was looking at the, uh, I was looking at different translations for verse 5, and you know, some of them say comprehend it at the end, but uh, a good many of them say overcome it. And I looked at the Greek, uh, the Greek uh, word of that, and I, I, I really think uh, overcome seems to be a, a more accurate translation. Uh, it seems to be a little bit better translation than comprehend. And so the darkness, it did not overcome it, in, implying that it tried to overcome it, and it tries to overcome it, but it can't. But nonetheless, it tries. And so the thing about darkness here, guys, that, we can, that, we, that is revealed to us here is that it is always hostile towards the light and seeks to extinguish it. And you know what that means? That means that there is no middle ground. You are either for God, you are either for Christ or against him. There is no, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just on the side. I'm just minding my own business. No, if you do not acknowledge that, that the Lord of glory is the Lord of your life, then you are trying to extinguish God. <laughs> you are trying to, you, if you could, you would put him to death. Because you, it's as if to say, who are you to tell me that I need to obey you? I want to obey myself. And so there is no middle ground. Even if you say there's, or you're in the middle ground, that, that's a form of self-deceit. And the Bible, the, the passage here illuminates, it, it clears up that deceit so that you know now that look you are in darkness <laughs> you, there, there is wrath on you and if you realize the true dilemma of your state then it's then then the, it's as if the scriptures is, is really beckoning you to come back to him all the all, all the more quicker <laughs> in that way and so if you don't accept Christ, just to summarize, you are a child of darkness, and if you consistently continue in your rebellion against the light, then you know God will one day cast you out into the black darkness, and that's, you can, uh, Jude 13 talks about that. It's a black darkness, complete darkness, complete separation from, from, from your Lord who created you. And don't find out what it's like. Do not find out what it's like. Turn back to God. And so there's no middle ground, friends. You're either for God or against him. And so we covered the basis of truth um, in verse 5 so far now, that God is light. All those who are called by him are also walk in light, and also that God cannot fellowship with those who walk in darkness. 
because he is holy. He is too pure. He is too righteous to look upon uh, to look upon sin and wickedness with favor. And so that's the basis of truth. That's the basis of who God is. And everyone who claims that he is walking in the light will order his life in such a way that reflects such truths about God. Moving on to verse 6, and back in our text in 1 John, if we say, it says here in verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice his truth. Again, John's argument, he's carrying it over from verse 5 before, and he now reaffirms here again that, look, since God is light, look, he cannot fellowship with darkness, and those who are still in darkness. And so we have here, our, uh, we can fill in our second outline, the first characteristic of those in whom truth is not found, in whom truth is void, devoid, that is that their lives are characterized by an ongoing habitual pattern of sinfulness and disregard for God's word. Now, does that mean, does that mean, is, God, is, is John saying that if we sin at all, then we cannot claim to have fellowship with God? No, that's not it, and I'll show you why. Look further ahead a little bit in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He says, my little children, obviously, those who are of the true fellowship, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But, or and, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, if John meant to say that fellowship with God requires that we never sin, and that we're perfectly obeying, then he wouldn't bother mentioning this instance in, where someone in the fellowship, a part of the true fellowship, is sitting. It doesn't make any sense. And if you also think about it, why would we even need forgiveness if we're perfect already? <laughs> makes no sense. And so if we were perfectly obedient to God, then Jesus Christ never needed to die on the cross. But we know too well we, we know too well that that's, that's obviously not true. We are not perfectly righteous. There's sin still present in our lives. And praise be to God that even so, and even so sin still rears its ugly head, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we'll look at that. We'll look at that. This cleansing process is an ongoing process. And we'll look at that. And so... Uh, and so this is not saying that if we sin, that we, we are disqualified from the true fellowship. Uh, rather, rather, John is referring to the overall pattern of a person's life. And to really illustrate that, turn with me a little bit to 1 John chapter 3. We'll see a better picture of this. In verse 4, everyone, it says, he says, who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared uh, for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is, who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, that is, he cannot Sin cannot be the primary function of his life, and it, and it finishes because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. That's what John is trying to do, make it painfully clear. Painfully clear. You say you're a Christian. You say you're a Christian. How does your life measure up? Just saying is not enough. What does your life look like? Because by the fruit of your life, it will give evidence to who is your who is your, your father here? Are you children of God? Is your father God or is your father the devil? And so it's talking about the practice, the practice, the overall pattern of a person's life. That's what the issue is here, a practical, practical, ongoing lifestyle, moment by moment, obedience, love for God and hatred and forsaking of sin. And so um, that, that, that's the idea of walking here. It's referring to that. Just that. Um, and next, now, next we'll go ahead and look at one of the false te teachings that was really responsible for this way of thinking that kind of seeped into the church or the churches. It was a heresy called Gnosticism. And, you know, let me read to you a definition that this, common, uh, this commentator named William Barclay uh, gives uh, because he summarizes it better than I can ever. Uh, and listen here, he says, Barclay says, 
There were those who claimed to be spe uh, specially intellectual and, and spiritually advanced, but whose lives showed no sign of it. They claimed to, be, to have ad advanced so far along the road of knowledge and of spirituality that for them, sin, sin had ceased to matter and the laws had ceased to exist. Basically, these guys were saying that they were claiming that it made no difference how they lived because they reached a certain high point of, of enlightenment and spirituality. And needless, needless to say, that's just plain wrong. That's just a bunch of baloney, if anything else. And, you know, it, it, truth, it, it's, it's never only intellectual. Sure, there's an intellectual element, but it's never only intellectual. That's not the point. And it's not even only moral. It's not humanitarian. It's not for you to be a good person, to feel good about yourself, or to live in, in, in relative peace to, to everybody else. No, it's about obedience. It's, if there's no obedience, there's no truth. Because truth, it points to and it demands obedience. And that's the crux of it, really. If you missed obedience, you missed the whole point. You're off in some other thing. That's not truth. <laughs> Baloney, that's what it is. And, you know, turn, turn with me to uh, Matthew 7, uh, verse 21, and we'll see a very graphic picture of this. Um, chapter 7, that was, verse 21. And this is Christ, um, way into the future. And, he's, and he says, not everyone... Or speaking of the future, it's not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Well, they're, they're saying they're, they're believers. That, that's, that's almost certainly clear. <laughs> that's their claim. What does Christ respond as? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice. Practice, that's what it's about. Practice lawlessness. Look, there is no getting around this. Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and if you claim him as your Lord too, know this about him. He will not accept anyone who, who lives in a continual, habitual disobedience. No matter how much you might confess him to be your Lord. And, and so, you know, the man who professes to love Christ, but yet still deliberately chooses to disobey him, is guilty of lying. And, and uh, not to, not to uh, scare you guys uh, uh, so much, but it's really about the practice of your life. And we're not talking about, we're not talking about an instance, see? It's about the, the culmination of your life, day to day to day to day. Oh, sorry, day to day to day. <laughs> and um, yeah, so don't, yeah, it's, I'm not, it's, the, the point of this is not for you to get so overly depressed about your sin, but it's for you to be realistic, like biblically minded so that you have a realistic diagnostic of where your life is before the Lord. And, and, and really, if, if, if you do love the Lord, this, this is not going to be an issue. This is not going to be an issue. But... Again, truth, if truth is in us, it will be evidenced. It will be evidenced by the practice of your life. And so that's what we're trying to get at here. Not to scare you. And so we'll move on. And so just to summarize again, uh, verse 6. So you can't separate truth from obedience. It's not, about the con it's not about what you say. It's about what you, what you say and what you do. <laughs> And so it's both. What you do needs to line up with what you say in terms of your faith in, in the Lord. Verse 7, moving on. Um, but uh, back in uh, 1 John here. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Again, John is carrying over the, our same argument from verse 5. Since God is light, those who have fellowship with him, with him will walk in the light. It's just, there's a no, it's no brainer there. Uh, and here we have the very first characteristic of those in whom truth is found. That is their lives, unlike those who are false, but rather those who are true, their lives are characterized by an ongoing, 
pattern, habitual pattern of godliness and obedience. You don't have to turn there. I'll, read, uh, I'll just read these references for you really quickly that illustrate this. John chapter 14, verse 23. It says, he says, if anyone loves me, speaking of Christ, or, God, or um, Christ speaking here, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will, come in, uh, we will come to him and make our abode with him. So love for God is equal to obedience to his word, and that's equal to an ongoing fellowship with God. And um, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 to 3, I read it to you. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, uh, uh, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, Paul's saying here to the church, uh, the Ephesian church, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so you see here, not only does walking faithfully preserve the joy of our fellowship with God, but walking faithfully in the light and that out of doing that, there's going to be a natural preservation too of our fellowship and the joy of our fellowship with each other. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling of the gospel as a church will ensure that we are maintaining the unity that is characteristic of the true fellowship. And so uh, those two. And, uh, and also I mentioned really quick, Ezra chapter 7 verse 10 little Ezra somewhere, he's, he's saying he's that he set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. There's the three parts of Christian life. That's what our lives as believers will gravitate to. That is three parts. We're going to study the word, we're going to practice the word, and then we're going to teach the word in whatever capacity we can. Not just, not just talking about pastor teachers, we're talking about everybody who is part of the true fellowship. This is, this is the bread and butter of our lives. And so you see here, truth is first to be discovered, not just stop there, it's not an intellectual thing, but it's to be discovered so that it is then to be obeyed. And then taught to other people so that they can obey it too. And so that's the crux of it all. Walking in the light as he himself is in the light. Now, we'll look at the second half of verse 7. Um, and, but uh, so just reading the whole verse again to get the context but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light we have fellowship with one another yes and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin and there's our second characteristic of the third bullet point in that those in whom truth is found is that they are being continually cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ from all sin and so notice here in verse 7 that the verb cleanses is in the present tense and so the sacrifice of Christ, it not only atones for our past sin at that moment, but it, it's cons is continually cleansing us from our sins in an ongoing manner. It's, it's, it's ongoing. It didn't stop. And so John, he's not talking about some, uh, it's, he's not just talking about the positional cleansing, that we're justified, yes, but he's more so, he's really talking about the practical, ongoing cleansing of sanctification in our lives, now that we've been justified. And, 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 and you know, we saw that in chapter 3, not too long ago, it's the practice of your life. The practice, 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 right? It's the practical, sanctifying effect of Christ's sacrifice. Both justification at that moment and then sanctification ongoing. And you know, the, uh, this theologian, John Stott, he put it very well. What is clear is that if we walk in the light, God has made provision to cleanse us from whatever sin would otherwise mar our fellowship with him or each other. And so listen, guys, we have eternal life and, and, you know, because we have eternal life, because we, we are in the truth, because we're in the light, and because we love holiness and God's word, because of all that, which should be true, but because of all that, it does not mean that we will, that we will stop sinning in this life. And let me, let me break that down. It's because as long as we are in the flesh, we will sin. We will sin. I mean, yes, sin will be less and less and less and less, but, uh, you know, and that's happening as, as we mature more and more in Christ. But in the ultimate sense, talking about the reality here, sin will be rearing its ugly head up until the point that we receive our glorified bodies. And that's a, an important reality that will keep us sober, will keep us on guard, but it's still a reality that needs to be faced. And that's the, type of, that's the reality that the Apostle Paul himself struggled with when he was saying in Romans, you know, I'm doing the thing I don't want to do, and the thing I want to do, I don't do. 
And I don't understand, I don't understand it. And so that's the type of struggle there that is the reality that sin will be in our lives as long as we're still in the flesh. Yes, decreasing frequency, but, but sin will keep appearing. Yes, uh, decreasing frequencies, but still appearing. And the, and the struggle is healthy and good, and it needs to be there. But also, I want you to understand that when you do sin, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, continues to cleanse you from that sin. It continues to cleanse you. How much sin? All your sin. Nothing barred, nothing excluded. And so that's the point. You, you realize that you're not there yet. You're not holy as he is holy. You're trying to get there, yeah, but you're not there yet. But the comfort is that as you struggle, as you struggle to get closer, 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 when you trip and fall and, and get impeded on that struggle with sin, your sin, you have still your advocate whom you trusted and whom you continue to trust to forgive that sin and to cleanse that sin. And you know, it, it's even before you confess, <laughs> which I think, which I think it points to, you know, it's, it's, it's an, on an as needed basis. And I, I would say immediate. And so the Lord, he cleanses us and he continues to cleanse us as we struggle to be holy as he is holy. And even though we disappoint him time and time again, he will forgive. So we get back up and keep struggling. And you know, there's a really, really wonderful picture of this. Turn with me to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 8. This picture of a, of a cleansing process for believers. And so verse 8 in chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, here Jesus is going, or he is washing the disciples' feet. And here in verse 8, it's Peter's turn. And, and you know, see, and, and of course, knowing how humble Peter is, right? He doesn't want the Lord to stoop down and clean his dirty feet. And so he says in verse 8, he said to him, never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, or if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. You know, typical gung-ho Peter, right? And so Jesus said to him, you know, knock it off, Peter. <laughs> the point is, the point is, he who has bathed, it says, only needs to wash, needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean. What Jesus is basically saying here is, in salvation, you are bathed, in Christ who removes all sin from you at that moment, in terms of your complete forgiveness, you are already clean and you do not need to ever take a bath again. Well, uh, spiritually speaking, <laughs> please take baths. But um, in that spiritual sense of um, that. Uh, but as you walk through this world, this fallen world, and, and you're going to get your feet dirty. You know, the dust of sin is going to get back on you. Even though the true essence of your inner person is totally different now. But yet, the dust of sin will keep getting on your feet. And what Christ is saying here, look, he's going to clean the remnants, the, the reappearing remnants of sin from you, too. And so, isn't that something? What a truth that is, that Christ provides continual washing and cleansing for those who are his. And so there's that. Um, and just to quickly summarize from verses 6 and 7 as we move on, if you are saved... The habitual, right, uh, the habitual practice of sin has been broken. Sin is no longer the, pra uh, the pattern of your life, but only sporadic events that interrupt the ongoing, now, habitual practice of righteousness. And even as those sporadic events of sin do occur, you know, they themselves, too, are being cleansed and forgiven completely by the blood of, Je by the blood of Jesus our Lord. And so that is such a wonderful truth um, that we need to always... Uh, bear in mind. And um, uh, we'll try to move on to uh, verse 8 and see how far we can get. Uh, verse 8, that's verse 8 back in 1 John. All right. 
And I think this will be our last point today. Uh, verse 8 says, if, 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 uh, if we say that uh, we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And we'll skip verse 9, actually, for now and jump to verse 10. If we say, verse 10, that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his truth, or his word, is not in us. And so here, uh, we find the second characteristic of those in whom truth is not found. And that is, they deny their sin before God. And in both these verses, verses 8 and 10, we have this person, uh, we have a man who says basically that he has no sin. And there are two likely possibilities. One, he's saying that he has no responsibility for his sin. And that's the ultimate self-deceit. And uh, let me read to you, don't turn here, but let me read to you really quick. Uh, Genesis 3, verse 11. After, this is after Adam and Eve had their sin found out by God. And God said to them, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman where, whom you gave to me, or gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me. And... Um, and I ate. And so you see there, Adam and Eve, they responded to their first sin, not by, conf not by, confess not by confessing it, but what did they do? They shifted the blame to someone else, and Adam and Eve, uh, or Adam and Eve, they blamed, uh, instead of confessing uh, their sin, they blamed somebody else. Um, that's what you call a blame shifter, and we'll, we'll have to go through that uh, next time. Um, but yeah, so, so far, uh, just, to do, uh, just a quick recap, we covered the basis of truth, that is that God is light, he is righteousness, and there can be no darkness in him. And we who claim to be true uh, believers must also walk in the light. And that is talking about a practice that is characterized by on an ongoing habitual pattern of righteousness and obedience. All right, let's play. Uh, let's pray. Uh, our precious Lord, we um, we thank you so much for our time this morning. And um, even though we didn't get to finish, we trust that um, you will use... Um, Use what uh, we learned today um, to fulfill your purposes. And, and Father, we, we really ask, Lord, would you help us to bear in mind what we learned today, that if we are to claim you as our Lord, that our life must, must uh, demonstrate um, an ongoing obedience. And out of that obedience, we express to you that we do indeed love you, and we do indeed uh, have, and we have, in fact, surrendered our lives to you. We thank you, Lord, and we lift you up. Be praised uh, for all time. In Christ's name, amen.